Hi, this is Dawn. It is October 19th, 2019, and I'm here with what feels like an important message to share with you regarding a number of different scripture passages, and all of this is tied to a very significant dream healing experience. I'm not exactly sure what to call it, just a very profound experience that I had. The topic here, or the main idea, is is Jesus, our high priest, and the return of and the establishment of the fulfillment of the law of love here on earth, and the amplification of those of us who are called to be co-heirs with Christ in this time. So let me begin with the experience that, that happened last night, and it was a prolonged, probably the most prolonged experience I've ever had like this. I would say it was a good eight hours. It's been a very difficult week. The past week included for me personally uh, a number of unexpected energetic waves from a variety of places. You know, some people who are in my life to one degree or another, and some just seemed incredibly random and like coming from people and places that I don't, I'm not even necessarily tied to in this life. And so it was quite an interesting experience. It did tire me out a bit. And so that was kind of where I was in my state. And so, but I was actually feeling really good yesterday, Friday, and um, went to bed, you know, somewhat tired from those experiences of the week, but in a good place. And I was listening to one of those, uh, I guess, heart healing meditation, sound meditation things online. I was listening to that and I um, was starting to fall asleep, but was still awake and had a, I guess you would call it a, a, a vision, but I, my eyes were closed and, and I saw 24, 24, uh, two rings of 12, um, 24 people coming toward me and they were each holding candles. And then there was this uh, this real feeling of blessing and nourishment to my soul, and the, the candles and the lights were each distinct. I don't know how to explain this exactly, but they each had their own gift that they were bringing to me. And then there was also this idea of consecration, somewhat of a protective energy, protection and purification. And, and then a, sort of a blessing toward whatever was happening next. It was an experience that was just profound. And early this morning before I got up, <clears throat> I was, you know, there was some more information that came through about this. Um, and then, you know, the, the knowing that I was meant to share this with you. And in particular, the information that was important to pass along was the significance of the 24. Also, I want to just mention here that there was something about that, this frequency that was brought in to me with the stream, but also for all of us would continue for five days. I don't understand the significance of five days, but I just wanted to mention that now. So it's the 19th. So that would be 2021, 20, 22, 23, 24, um, through the 24th, whatever day that is, October 24th. Oh, interesting. 24th, uh, number 24. I just realized that. So I want to just talk about the symbolism of the number 24. In the Bible, the number 24 is most often associated with the priesthood. It's also connected with heaven and earth, earth and sky, and the bringing together of those two. Of course, priests served God, and they were called to live a life devoted to God and their work was dedicated to God. 24, of course, is, is 12. We all know the significance of the number 12 throughout the biblical prophecy and, and 24 being two times 12. So it's like doubling, a doubling, an amplification of that. And, you know, the 12 always represents the completion and divine authority on earth. And it also is a stable foundation. And so the idea of the 24, again, is, is a, a doubling and amplification. And then, of course, 12 times 12 is 144. So I also want to say that when I had my dream experience, there was this idea of the 24 with the lights being a temple that I was in. I was in their temple. 
in the temple of God. And so again, back to that consecration or that uh, dedication aspect was really, really important. Now I want to skip back to the Old Testament. In the book of First Chronicles chapter 24, there is the the calling out by King David of the 24 courses of priests. And this, each of the 24 lines of priests, and there was a leader for each of those 24, each one of them had a particular role. The division of, um, of work or responsibility was divided equally among these 24, but they had particular assignments, particular roles, particular missions. Um, and there was also a, an order into which these were um, these priests fulfilled their their duties. So that's sort of a context. And also I want to mention that, because um, I'm going to talk in a second about Melchizedek and, and Jesus. And um, in, in Genesis chapter 14 is where Melchizedek is introduced. And there's an account of um, Ab Abraham, who was then called Abram, and Abraham has gone out and gone to battle to rescue Lot and Lot's people. And the king of Sodom, who he's battling against, comes out to meet him in a valley called the Valley of Shave. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that, or Shave. Um, Shave. It is the king's valley. And many people say, many historians, archaeologists say that this Valley of Shava is actually the Valley of the Plain or what we know as the Kidron Valley, which has high significance for all faiths, the three monotheistic religions, for Jews, Muslims, and Christians. Now, the Kidron Valley, if that is indeed the same as the Valley of Shava, um, Jesus crossed many, many, many times in his ministry when he was traveling between um, Bethany and Jerusalem. Um, and, and so one of the times he, he passed through the Kidron Valley, for example, which may be the Valley of Shava as well, is when uh, he rode on the donkey um, through from the Mount of Olives into the gates of Jerusalem, and he passed through the Kidron Valley on this donkey. He also walked this valley in his last walk when he returned to the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, John chapter 18 says, you know, that when he finished praying, he left his disciples and he crossed the Kidron Valley. And on the other side was this garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, and he and his disciples entered into it. And this valley um, is associated with the end times. Um, in Jeremiah chapter 31, it says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when this city will be rebuilt for me from the tower of Hanel to the corner gate. The measuring line will stretch from there straight to the hill of Gareb and then turn to Goa. The whole valley where dead bodies and ashes are thrown and all the terraces out to the Kidron Valley on the east as far as the corner of the horse gate will be holy to the Lord. The city will never again be uprooted or demolished. So as we know, there's been much destruction in this, in, in this region of the world and in the Middle East and in the Kidron Valley, there have been built many, many cemeteries um, from, again, all these faith traditions. So back to Genesis chapter 14, in this valley is where in the day uh, after his battle, Abram is, is, has returned with Lot and the people who were taken captive. He has rescued them. And after this battle, the king of Sodom comes out. Um, and then we see the introduction of Melchizedek. In verse 18 of Genesis 14, it says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. So, so this is the introduction of Melchizedek, called the king of Salem, but again, a priest of God most high, who blessed Abram. And, and this is the first blessing here that uh, ushers in, you know, all that happened after that in Genesis. So in Hebrews chapter 7, we read that this, this Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. 
Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of his plunder. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi who become priests to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their fellow Israelites, even though they also are descended from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth of, from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In the one case, the tenth is collected by people who die, but in the other case, by him who is dedicated and declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham, because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established who established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. He of whom these things are said belonged to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, and in regard to that tribe Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. Others become priests without any oath, but he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other priests, unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priest men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son, who has been made perfect forever. Now that was from chapter 7 of Hebrews, and, and that chapter is showing that Jesus comes in the in the order, he is in the order of Melchizedek, who was not born, who was not given his priestly role uh, from any um any of the Levitical traditions, but rather from God Most High, a priest of the Most High. And so Jesus is our high priest, and he will return, and he He came in the name of love. So I want to um, skip now, and I want to mention Revelation chapter 4. In Revelation 4, we see the 24 elders. Um, it says this, after this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were twenty-four other thrones, and seated on them were the twenty-four elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold upon their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings of peals and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were 
four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second like an ox. The third had a face of a man, and the fourth was a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So that is the uh, 24 elders in Revelation, and in many ways, <clears throat> the uh, 24 who came to me, you know, in, in this, this experience I had last night reminded me of that scene of the 24 um, elders. So now what I want to share is Psalm 72, which is the other thing that came to me, because in Psalm 72, there are 24 promises essentially or 24 things that are mentioned that Jesus when he comes as high priest in the order of Melchizedek when he comes returns there are 24 things he will do and and so this is a psalm psalm 72 is a psalm of Solomon I'm going to read it and then I'm going to uh, share with you the 24 uh, promises or the 24 fulfillments that are to come so psalm 72 reads Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. May he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people, the hills, the fruit of righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. May he endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all generations. May he be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish and prosperity abound till the moon is no more. May he rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May the desert tribes bow before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of distant, distant shores bring tribute to him. May the king of Sheba and Seba pre present him gifts. May all kings bow down to him and all nations serve him, for he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. Long may he live. May gold from Sheba be given him. May people ever pray for him and bless him all day long. May grain abound throughout the land on the tops of the hills. May it sway. May the crops flourish like Lebanon and thrive like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. Then all nations will be blessed through him, and they will all call him blessed. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. This concludes the prayers of David, son of Jesse, what Jesus, our high priest, will do. So what Jesus, our high priest, will do, the 24 promises. One, he will righteously judge the people. Two, he will judge with justice the poor and the needy. Three, peace will be brought by the mountains. Four, small hills shall also experience peace. Five, he shall judge the poor. Six, he shall save the children of the needy. Seven, those who oppress will be crushed. Eight, he shall rule like rain upon grass. Nine, he shall rule like the water that showers the globes. Ten, he will cause the righteous to flourish. 11. He will bring the righteous an abundance of peace. 12. He shall rule from sea to sea. 13. He shall rule from the river unto the ends of the earth. 14. When he hears the needy cry out, he will deliver them. 15. The poor and those who have no help will also be delivered. 16. Those who are needy and weak will receive compassion. 17. The lives of those in need will be saved. 18. The needy who are oppressed and experience violence will be redeemed. 19. The blood of those in need will be precious in his sight. 
Twenty, he will cause an abundance of grain on the earth. Twenty-one, he will bring an abundance of fruit. Twenty-two, he will make those of the city flourish like grass. Twenty-three, he will make his name to be continued. Twenty-four, he will bless all men. I want to share one little bit of trivia in Psalm 72, 8, which says he shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. It's interesting that the national motto of Canada is a mari askew ad mare, which comes from that verse, Psalm 72, 8. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. Um, the timing of this um, is also interesting just because there's a hotly contested election happening in Canada on Monday, this coming Monday, the 21st. All of these scriptural threads from, you know, first chronicle and the calling out of the hall, high priests or the 24, um, priests, um, from, uh, by King David, uh, all the way to, you know, Melchizedek in Genesis and then Hebrews chapter seven, um, talking about, you know, Jesus as our high priest. Um, and if you read the, the rest of the book of Hebrews, I believe it's chapter, is it 12? I'm not sure about that, but the, um, there's the, the chapter I love, you know, with, with such a high priest, um, and Jesus, you know, making the case for Jesus is our high priest because we are no longer under the law of the Levitical, Levitical priesthood. Um, but rather, you know, we have such a, a new a high priest that um, intercedes with us before God and calls us forward to to be co-heirs with him and to uh, exist in the law of love, the new covenant. And and so all of all of, uh, you know, the, the references there in Hebrews and, and the, it's the fulfillment, the completion of the law. And then the 24 elders in Revelation who sing holy, holy, holy and bow down. And there is a continual um, return to the kingdom of Christ. And, and, the, and again, the law of love um, and a new heaven and a new earth. And that's what the book of Revelation is all about. And then Psalm 72, going back to that Psalm of Solomon, that is a calling, uh, uh, it's a, it's a, um, it's a hearkening to what will be and what is indeed now coming into fruition. So all of this is just highly significant right now. Um, and, you know, again, I was told that this energy of, you know, whatever this was, this experience was, you know, for, for me, which is not just for me, but for all of us, um, would be, be continuing for five days. And then I was also told to, interestingly, to share a poem that I've been, uh, I'm actually doing a painting of it right now. It's a Rumi poem, and it's called Come Horseback. And it refers to 15 evenings of full moon. And I was shown that that was significant and apparently started with the last full moon, which was about a, what, about a week ago. And so this energy is continuing through 15 evenings, which I think is about the time until we'll have the next new moon. So in any case, this poem is by Rumi. It is called Come Horseback, and uh, you can find it in the book, The Soul of Rumi, by, which is translated by Coleman Barks. Come Horseback. Come horseback through the spider webs of twilight as 15 evenings of full moon, as the sun on holiday, the stars performing every small zodiac wish wheel into the presence of these lovers where you remember me, look around, drawing the blade of your question, where is the one whose candle burns in the dawn? Where is the handful of dirt that somehow joins with the light of the Pleiades? You keep resurrecting like St. George. Again, where is the friend who calls presence out of absence and cuts the umbilical by mentioning Shams e Tabriz? So that was Come Horseback by Rumi. And uh, one other note on the horse, horses and horseback. Um, three years ago in 2016, uh, first when I was in France in March, uh, late March, it was, it was Easter of that year. Um, and then in June in New Mexico, in my month of enchantment, when I went to, um, New Mexico for the first time. And then a third time when I went back to France, um, at the, toward the end of November 
and stayed through early December. And I had a very, very significant experience there that I probably will be mentioning again, just because it feels like it, we're coming to some some reiteration of that. So I'll share that later. Um, but all of those three points for me in 2016, three years ago, there was a very significant um, and, and it was a continuing sequential unfolding of a vision of, of horse uh, horses. Um, instead of the four horsemen of the ap apocalypse, there were three horses that ride, three riders, in, particularly in the June um, experience in New Mexico. Um, and then the horse, the image of the horses and the coming, the thundering hooves of the horses were significant um, in both experience I, in experiences I had in France. And both of the, the experiences in the south of France were associated with Jesus directly and with um, with the bones of Jesus and, and with his sorry, with his full, um, with his full re, uh, re embodiment, uh, here on earth. I don't exactly know what that means, but I do. It was a highly significant experience for me. And so horses were significant in, in each of those cases. Um, and I, I have some art, there's some art that I created, um, on my art website, um, and uh, that has to do with the calling forth of the horses. And I wrote many poems about that, that are um, uh, about the horses. Um, I may or may not include that below in the, in the comments, but I did want to mention it just because there is this idea of the thundering hoofbeats along with, you know, the candles and the 24 um, imageries and, and imagery and the fact that this will, this energy will continue to uh, increase and amplify within each one of us for at least five days. And there's something about these 15 nights of full moon. So it's a bit of a mystery to me, even what, you know, what some of this means. Um, so it's a little difficult, but I did know it was important to share those passages with you. Um, for anyone who does listen, I hope that, you know, this is, you know, brought you some, some measure of light, um, or, or, or some, uh, connected, uh, you know, some thread for you in your own life's experience. Um, and I just knew that I was meant to share it, uh, regardless of who listens. So much love, uh, many blessings and, um, in, uh, enjoy this weekend ahead. And, um, I think I will, uh, just put video of a candle as the, the light of the world, um, in terms of the, the visual for this, since I did an audio recording, uh, instead of a video today. All right. Lots of love. Bye-bye. Candles, the mystery and the miracle. I need to leave early the next morning. So I set my alarm for 6 33 AM. I've had tingles up and down the right center of my back for four days now. Some huge clearing or activation, both perhaps. I've been partly restless, a little sad, and feeling very close to my soul, though just far enough away that I cannot form words or thoughts for whatever is stirring there. As soon as I set the alarm, I immediately feel the presence in the room of four to five beings. At the time, I simply notice. I do not see them, but I sense them as five distinct beings. Immediately, I recognize the energy of Jesus, who has been with me all my life. Einstein is being funny, up to antics with wordplay, a juggling act and tracing some kind of numbers on an invisible wall. A very tall man, thin and kind, Melchizedek the priest, perhaps? stands beside the familiar, short, Native American woman who watches over me but does not speak. Rounding out the group of visitors, I sense an angel dressed in white and reminding me of the part of me I lost when the one we called the innocents flew from me. When I feel them there, the room is all abuzz, as if they are all talking at once. Then I make it out. They are saying, happy new birthday, happy new birthday. The emphasis is on the word new, which repeats like kernels of corn popping. I am caught somewhere between stunned and puzzled. The words new birthday call to mind my affirmation of faith and the day I made it official that I would follow Jesus, though he had come first to be with me. My mind tumbles back in time to the winter of 1976. I have grown up in this church where they speak of accepting Jesus into your heart and have been confused as Jesus has always been in my heart, 
a much fuller, more human, happier, and wiser Jesus than the one whose picture adorns the walls of churches across this land. The chaplain and fellow members of the congregation seem amused when he asks me where Jesus lives, and I reply enthusiastically, in my heart. These are the words I told him when he first asked me in his office. Jesus already lived there. He has always lived there. Though puzzled by the ritual of accepting him, I boldly walk down the aisle and make the decision to follow Jesus, who has been my shepherd all along. It is my baptism weeks later in the cold waters of the barracks nearby on a nearby army base that changes me most. I am forever grateful that the chaplain's son, a drummer a few years older than me, whom, incidentally, I and every girl on the base have a teenage crush on, is there to document the moment. My face is radiant as I emerge from those waters. To those present, perhaps, it was merely a ceremony of sorts. For me, it was a christening. On the surface it, was, surface, it was merely an outward symbol of my act of faith and an act of unity with the church. On a much deeper level, it was, for me, a soul-level acknowledgement of some sacred mission I was yet to understand 37 years later. Unbeknownst to many of those around me, including the family into which I was born, my inner world was in shambles. Just 12 years old, I arose most days unsure if I would live to see the setting sun. For no particular reason I can find now. There had been no immediate threat. I did not live in a war zone. I was well fed, loved, and afforded every opportunity. Still, I lived in the shadow of an unnameable terror that was ancient, faceless, nameless. My immersion into those baptismal waters was, for me, an accepting of the mantle of some coat of many colors worn within, accepting this life as it was given, surrendering on some deep level my need to know how it all would go. I am still pondering all of this on my drive a day later as I pass Council Grounds State Park near Merrill, Wisconsin. As I pass these sacred lands, dotted with red and white pines, hardwood and hemlock, according to Wisconsin's Department of Natural Resources, I will remember well the silent councils within. I see the familiar scene within, with Jesus, my beloved Jeshua, who I remembered well from the beginning, sitting in silence with all the fragments of me. We sat often, immersed in a knowing beyond words. Other times, each voice that lived inside me clamored for a way to be better than the rest, and chaos broke out. He was unmovable and loved us through it all. Without his steadfast presence, I could never have made my journey back to sacred wholeness, which I write about in my memoir by the same name. More signs and wonders as I pass a giant billboard that says, Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. I want to scream, yes, Jesus the Christ died on a cross, but this altogether misses the point. For the Jesus I know came for life, to live and to be life, so that we might have life and have the life more abundant. This is the core teaching of Jesus, not that we are sinners in need of saving. I feel a fire building within me now, a gathering up and a gathering in for some transmutation. I will not be silent. I will speak. I am on the edge of afraid about how the words were tum will tumble out, but I know I will let them come, nevertheless. They have been a long time coming. The rain falls heavier as I drive on, and my mind drifts back to the scene last night. I thought first of my pronouncement of faith in Jesus and the baptism at age 12 when I had heard those words, New Birthday. Then quickly my mind had skipped forward to the sudden realization that I actually was born at 6.33 in the morning. I must have chosen the numbers inadvertently. I laugh aloud at the collection of angels and saints, and they continue to chant, Happy New Birthday! Happy New Birthday! And I think, well, it's not like it's my actual birthday. That's January 15th, remember? A voice answers quickly. This is all unfolding in my mind, but I know it is no mere imagination. I hear, no, your birthday before your birthday. Then there is singing in the cabin, but not happy birthday. It's more like some ceremonial singing that I have not heard before. I am standing perfectly still when I realize they are gone. 
but not really, of course. I know somehow I carry them with me, and they will never leave me, for I am them and they are me, intrinsically belonging to one another. At some point, as I am standing in place, it sinks in that they have said, birthday before your birthday. My heart is reaching for something. I suddenly think the word conception, but I am thinking of the Spanish pronunciation with the I sounding like an E and a long O sound, concepcion. Based on my birth date, May 26 would have been roughly a month after my conception. Later I will learn that apparently in the time of Aristotle, it was commonly thought that ensoulment, that moment the soul enters a body, happens at around 40 days after conception for a male and 90 days afterward for a female. Muslim scholars also believe this happens somewhere between 40 and 120 days post-conception, I will read, with 42 being the most revered in that tradition. Traditionally, many believe a soul enters the body at the moment of conception. Who knows if it means anything at all? Maybe the point is just that now, this moment, was new, and I could be born to it. I decide to draw a card from the Enchanted Journey card deck I keep on my phone. I pick the number 46 card, Coming Apart. It says, Separation brings good fortune. I do not yet understand separation from what. I leave early the next morning, headed across Wisconsin to Minnesota. There is something about this day that feels important, sacred somehow, a christening. I think the words before my mind comprehends the significance of them. When I begin to consider the origin of such a thought, my mind is drawn first to the child's union with the church. Then I look up the definition and am struck by the naming and dedication aspects that are integral to the christening of a child or the christening of a ship. It is interesting that now, 25 days into my journey, I should think of christening. Yet, this symbolic affirmation of a whole new way of seeing myself and this world feels important. I drive for two hours or more before looking up at the car clock. It reads 9-11. I think of Holy Terror, the book I had intended to work on during this trip, one that is related to the events that unfolded for me and for our world around the date we all know so well. I cannot seem to articulate all my heart has to share, so I distract myself by wondering if clocks in automobiles will ever have the capacity to update automatically to the current local time. That would be handy, I think. I consider, as I have so often, the global themes of destruction and restoration, the story we have repeated in endless cycles of time. Then my thoughts are drawn back to the more rapidly spinning cycles that filled my early years. Had I known the isolation I would experience wearing that internal coat of many colors, would I have chosen it? I was a lover and a dreamer, and though I lived through decades when it seemed that both love and any dream I had for my life had eluded me, I had, in fact, been held within them, waiting for this very day, this very moment. I remember all the times in churches someone had told this Joseph story and how irritated I had been at how many people completely missed the point. I thought of how internally I had traveled into a proverbial Egypt so that one day something might be brought out to be set free. It is a gray day as I drive through the rolling hills and valleys near Wausau, Wisconsin. Signs warn me to watch for fog. In addition, there is road work. The shoulder is closed. Another sign warns, stay in line. Rough road ahead, says another. The orange and white construction barrels dot the landscape for as far as the eye can see. Towering cranes are parked just past miles of dirt mounds. I am grateful to see the sign that says it is the end of the blast zone. I am even more grateful that there have been no blasts today. This life is a perilous journey for all souls who dare to travel the open road. Despite the construction, this day is all synchronicity. I have been considering the long stretch of lonely years and also my profound gratitude for having been chosen to shepherd my son's early life. I smile thinking of my dogs, Emily and Edgar, 
Someone had abandoned this brother and sister, Aussie Shepherd Pups, at the county library on a rainy spring break 14 years ago. I have been especially attached to Edgar, named after Poe, whose poetry I had been reading that day. He is blind and deaf now, and I have missed him on this journey into my heartland. Just as I am thinking of how I love him, I pass a sign for Edgar, Wisconsin, off Highway 29 West. What are the odds? I often pen what I call essays from the edge and share them online. Here's the realization I've had this week. There is no edge. We are limitless, infinitely expanding beings. We have been accustomed to working in terms of beginning, middle, and end, or capping life with birth and death. But Celine had it right when she sang the love song tied to the story of the world's most famous sinking ship. Our hearts do indeed go on and on. This is the mystery and the miracle, that there is never only one birthday, and we are being born and reborn to a greater and greater whole. We're going to need more candles.